Uh, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> it's a, it is a good morning. It's almost late again, but uh, okay. now we have great volunteers. Okay, I have today, we're starting something new at Deep Water called Giving Back, and we're going to give somebody this $100 bill. So who wants to? You know I'm not. Okay, I'm I'm not. not. I'm not. I got me a Benjamin. It's all about the Benjamin. I'm a deeply Benjamin. Uh, but, you know, if, if I have a $100 bill, probably, is there anyone here in the room who does not want it? Okay, one person. I think you're lying. No. <laughs> uh, you know, most of us want money because, you know, money makes life a little easier, right? I mean, and there's there's always something you want. I mean, anyone have an Amazon wish list? You know, it's like, it's mine's constantly full with stuff, and uh, there's always things I want that I can't afford. Uh, but here's the, we're, we're doing awkward conversations with Jesus, and Jesus actually had a lot to say about money. And one of the things he said, which is a, a perhaps a famous passage, uh, and you guys chose this one, so when we're talking about money, but it's your fault, you guys chose the summer series because of the, uh, the survey that we have out there. But here it is. It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. You ever heard that one? Um, here's the problem. We're all rich. Now, some of you are going, I'm not rich. But that's because you haven't been to the rest of the world. Right. If you go to the rest of the world, the poorest of our poor are doing pretty well by some standards. Uh, nearly half the world's population, more than 3 billion people, live on less than $2.50 a day. Wow. More than 1.3 billion live in extreme poverty with less than $1.25 a day. So our living standard is probably a little higher than, than the rest of the world. Uh, uh, you know, I mean, 805 million people worldwide do not have enough food to eat. In America, we have trouble because we eat too much. <laughs> uh, it's really, you know, it's one of those tricky passages. I remember reading it when I was a new believer and I was reading through the Bible and I hit that one. And I'll be honest, I didn't understand it. And I was like, man, I guess we can't have any money, right? Because, you know, it's, it, you know, and then I remember talking to somebody, and maybe you've heard this explanation. Uh, yeah, I talked to somebody, and they said, well, there was actually this gate called the Camel Gate through the city. Anyone hear this one? Yeah. And if a camel got it down on its knees, it kind of wiggled through there. It, it was very hard, but the camel could make it. Anyone hear that explanation? Yeah. Total, complete fabrication and rubbish. There's no such gate. There's no such thing. But it's one of those like preacher stories. Like one preacher preached it, and then it gets passed around. Everyone thinks it's true, but then you look it up, and you're like, oh, there's no history to that. So it, it doesn't actually exist. So we're going to turn to Luke chapter 18, and you can pop open you version if you want, or it's going to be up here on the screen. And, and we're going to look at this, because really... To understand Jesus, the words of Jesus are really life changing. We need to understand them. And uh, the key to understand this phrase is really the key to understanding something important about the gospel, the good news. And misunderstanding it really kind of throws off your whole idea and your whole concept of money. Uh, so Luke chapter 18, starting in, see, I got back to Luke. You knew I would do it somehow. This one actually shows up in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, but I chose Luke, because I, I like Luke. Uh, and so in Luke chapter 18, starting verse 18, it says, Once a religious leader asked Jesus this question, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Now, it, you know, if you read different translations, you kind of have different titles for his name, you know, at ESV or NIV, you'll say a ruler or certain ruler. Uh, we're really not certain what he was a ruler of. I know I just ended the sentence with a preposition, sorry for... <laughs> uh, the, the words used there, and Luke kind of uses it for different offices, and so it's probably more to highlight the fact that the guy is well off. Because if you have money in any society, you tend to be a decision maker and a player. So this is, 
it, you know, maybe a translation would be, a certain player came to, uh, uh, you know, because if you look at Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they, they kind of, they all tell the same story, but they tell it a little differently. Like, if John and I were telling a story about, you know, going out and getting coffee with Sam, we would all tell it a little differently, we'd bring in more detail, and so they all have these little different details. If you combine all three of them, uh, we find out that he's rich, young, and powerful. So he is, you know, really a lot like celebrities in our culture. Think like Justin Timberlake or Justin Bieber, whichever your Justin is. Uh, but with maybe different moral standards. Uh, but I mean, they had influence, they had money, they'd be looked up to and admired in their community. Uh, this is the kind of guy you'd like want to introduce your daughter to because, you know, he, you know, he wasn't a player. <laughs> I mean, he, he was, We'll see. He's, he's, a, he's a good stand-up kind of guy. Uh, you know, this is the guy who was voted most likely to succeed in high school. Anyone voted most likely? I certainly wasn't. Uh, I was. I was surprised I wouldn't vote a class clown. I am a kind of idiot. Anyway, so um, you know, it says, you know, it says, you know. So Jesus says, "Why do you call me good?" Jesus asks. Only God is truly good. Uh, and you know, you kind of wonder why he calls Jesus good teacher. You know, is he trying to butter Jesus up? You know, because, you know, he's, remember, he's a player. <laughs> you know, he knows how to work things. Or, you know, is it kind of casual use? And, and because of Jesus' reaction, some people have said, well, oh, yeah, see, it shows that, you know, Jesus is saying he's not divine. Uh, you know, because, you know, the way he's saying only God is good. But really, Jesus is pointing to who he really is. You know, you're saying this kind of maybe flippantly or just to you know, influence me. But, hey, do you really know who you're talking to here? And, uh, you know, oh, you say you're good. How good? Do you recognize who I am? It's, you know, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Uh, it's interesting. You know, this question was asked at another point, too. Remember, and you know, if we talk about the Good Samaritan, they ask, you know, what must I do? Jesus gives different answers, right? So that should tell you something right there. Uh, it says, you know, uh, you know, what must I do uh, to inherit eternal life? Um, you know, and uh, Jesus says, you know, but to answer your question, you know the commandments. You must not commit adultery. You must not murder. You must not steal. You must not testify falsely. Honor your father and mother. So these are like part of the big ten, the, the, the ten commandments. You know, probably if you live in America, you at least heard of them. You know, if we, I, when we did a series on the ten commandments, most people can't name more than a couple. We say they're really important, and then we're like, uh, you can't kill people. I'm pretty sure you can't steal, adultery, and that's it. You know, most of us don't know the honor of the father and mother in there and some other things. And, and so, you know, you know he's, Jesus is saying, hey, have you, have you done these things that you should already know? And, and, you know, the man replies, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. Now, I always wonder, you know, if he was married, would his wife say the same thing? You know, you know, the persons who know you best sometimes see where you fail the most, which is one of the reasons we really push community here is because when you know people, they can call you on your junk. <laughs> you know, because you look like you got it all together on Sunday, you know, you dressed up, you smile at everyone, at least for the last hundred yards when you walk into the building. Because um, you cut some, one of you cut me off on the way here today. Oh, oh. I'm kidding. You, know? <laughs> so you were all like curious. You're like, wait, wait, was it me? You're like, wait, you walked in right before them. <laughs> was it us? No. Uh, you know, but we, we, we kind of like act like we got it together. So I wonder, you know, whether, you know, his wife would say the same thing. Uh, Really, you know, he's asserting he's lived up to all the religious requirements, right? He's, he's done these things, uh, you know, since the age of 13, he'd have his bar mitzvah, this big celebration, he's a son of the covenant, son of the promise, and, you know, Paul says the same thing about himself, you know, you know that he was legalist, le legally righteous, and so, uh, so it, it could be that, he, let's just assume for a minute, that he's telling the truth, and he's done these things. Uh, and so, why is he coming to Jesus? 
you know, is he just showing his awesomeness? Is it like a humble brag? What do I need to do? You know about it all. You know? I'm waiting for Jesus to validate me and tell everyone here how awesome I truly am. Uh, you know, you just want Jesus to go, just keep being you, because you're awesome. And he has the finger gun. I don't know if Jesus did finger guns or not. <laughs> you know, here's your gold star. Uh, or did he have, like, maybe this nagging feeling that something wasn't just right? Like, some of you, you left the house today. Did you turn off the stove? Yes. yes. Or the coffee maker? Yes. And now you're not sure. You're asking yourself, did I turn off the stove or the coffee maker? Uh, you, know, you know, is it kind of that nagging suspicion when you think, oh, maybe, like I told you about the time I went to the airport and I had this nagging suspicion that something was wrong. And I, yes. I, I tell you, I mean, I thought I was going to die because I had this nagging suspicion something was wrong and I thought, thought I was going to die in the airport and I, was, I thought the plane was going down. I'm like, what do I need to do? Do I need to lead people to Jesus? I kept praying. I felt like I was supposed to go on this trip. Like, I was like, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die on this plane. You know, I was like kissing the kids goodbye. I'm hugging. I'm like, oh, I love you guys so much. And, you know, and then I go to get on the plane. I'm at BWI. They can't find my flight. Because I'm supposed to fly out of Philly. So Ooh. the nagging suspicion was Jeff, you're an idiot. You went to the wrong airport. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of like that. Kind of like, you know, something's just not right. I, they did get me on a plane, though. I can't remember the airline, but they were great. Uh, I can't remember where they flew me back to then. I, uh, anyway, but anyway, um, <laughs> you know, kind of that nagging suspicion. Or sometimes, you know, maybe just looking for more. Like, you're just like, man, it's kind of... It's like when you open the refrigerator, and men know this more than probably women, because you open up the refrigerator, and there's like ketchup, mustard, and a jar of olives. And I don't even eat olives. And then you're like, you walk around the house, you, you don't open it up again, right? Because you're thinking maybe magically, you know, there's some sort of dwarf or elf that lives in there that will fill my fridge and bring me some, something good. And you know what I mean? You open the fridge like 10 times, and you stare at it, you close it, you open it, nothing new comes in. Is it kind of that, you know, you know, there's nagging suspicion, maybe. But, and, and so when, when Jesus heard his answer, he said, you know, Jesus doesn't say, denied you are wrong. <laughs> he says this. He says, there is still one thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. You know, Jesus like saying, hey, you just got to fix this one thing. You know, it's, it's like when you're coaching, uh, like I coach wrestling, and, and sometimes there's like just a little kind of thing that someone needs to change so they can move from JV to varsity. Like you just do this one little thing. But here's the thing. That one little thing seems like a really big thing, doesn't it? Like give up all your money. And it would be easy, you know, maybe if you had like just a dollar. <laughs> but, but this guy, he, you know, uh, he, he has a lot. And Mark adds, you know, that Jesus loved him. You know, he said in Mark 10, 21, says, looking at the man, Jesus felt genuine love for him. Jesus wasn't being a jerk, right. but he looked at him, he had compassion, he loved him, he could see what the heart of the matter was with him. You know, and he says it out of, not out, with love, not out of condemnation, but he sees something that's holding him back. Uh, it, it's kind of like, again, coaching. Sometimes, you know, you know, like, you know, you teach a kid a move, and then they're like, they're like demonstrating, and they're like, how's that, coach? And you're like, that's absolutely horrible. <laughs> uh, because I could be, you know, I'm, I'm like the Simon of coaches, you know. <laughs> Simon <laughs> Cowlett. <laughs> you know, because if I told them, hey, that's great, that's going to work. And then they shoot underneath a, you know, 300-pound heavyweight, and they sprawl on them and get squashed, then it's, oh, I really thought it would work. No, but I mean, you've got to make sure you know, the person's doing it right. And so you know, this is Jesus kind of coaching him and saying, hey, look, here's the problem. I love you, but you got something wrong. It says, verse 23, but when the man heard this, he became very sad, for he was very rich. Um, you know, it's, it says, he, you know, he went away. And it's really very rare in the Gospels to get a direct invitation. And then it's, you know, but, but the guy just sort of walks away. We're not really told what happens to him. We kind of guess, uh, you know, and you wonder what would he have done if, if, what would Jesus have said if he said, okay, I'll sell everything. It's kind of a test, isn't it? You know, Abraham, if you, if you heard the story of Abraham and Isaac, a lot of baggage to unpack there, but, but Abraham, you know, he's waited and waited and waited for this son, and then he's supposed to go sacrifice him, and he brings him up to the mountain, and like just before he brings down the knife, you know, God says, stop, and you know, I got this other sacrifice for you. It's all this big test. 
You know, and, and so was this a test on his part? You know, like, had he reacted differently? Would Jesus have, have, have said, oh, uh, never mind? <laughs> uh, you know, but, you know, the problem is, lots of people have money and love and serve God, but it's easy when you have a lot of money to really love that money. <laughs> you know, if you possess riches... Sometimes it's easy for those riches to possess you. Now, as much as you have, we all end up in the same place. Now, I've told you, for my, I have, I've given all kinds of funeral instructions. I hope everyone remembers all of these. One of them is that you're going to hook a U-Haul trailer to the back of the hearse when it brings me to the cemetery. Because I just want people to go, what? Uh, there's also going to be a bowl of candy on my belly. I mean, we're going to Because you can't be real sad when there's little short Snickers. <laughs> Fun size is not the little. Come on. Fun size is like the gigantic <laughs> That's a fun size. <laughs> and bacon. Or we bacon. <laughs> it has to be bacon. Uh, but, you know, as much as you might have in this world, in the end, it, you know, it, it doesn't save you. It doesn't make you right. You don't bring it with you. Uh, and you can even do a lot of commandments. You can do a lot of the good things that the Bible commands us to do. But do you love God? Now, I, you know, uh, they, they recommend you take your wife on a date night and everything. We, we don't do very well at that, but <laughs> we do date lunches for Indian food and things like that occasionally. Uh, but, you know, you, you, and you, um, you could take your date, your wife on a date night. You could, you know, buy her roses, flowers, tell her you, you know, but if you don't love her, it doesn't really mean anything, right? And it's really, it's our, you know, you can do the right thing. You can fulfill the commandments, but where is your love? Is your love God, or is your love your money and your stuff? Um, you know, uh, you know, and, and it's kind of like another another analogy in marriage is with my wife. You know, it, my wife says to me, "I love you." You know, the husband's like, "You know, hey, I took out the trash." <laughs> Now, with my wife, that would probably work. <laughs> She's like, thank you for doing things. But if your wife says, I love you, one, you better have taken out the trash. <laughs> but the proper response back, you know, is to love them, not just do things. And God wants not just our obedience to the externals, the obedience to these rules, but God ultimately wants our heart. And where's the man's heart? Is it with the law? Loving God? Doing that stuff? No, his love is, um, you know, it's about the Benjamins or shekels or whatever. <laughs> Dare I? Uh, you know, in Matthew five, Jesus even would, you know, he, he ups the ante on those on, on the commandments. You know, he says, you know, if, if, if you know, okay, you have it murdered. Do you hate? You know, you, so you again, committed adultery. Do you lust? And so, truthfully, you know, he probably didn't even do it because commandments ultimately aren't just about your external behavior, but it's about where your heart is. Is your heart with the things where God has a heart? And it says, this, it says when Jesus saw this, he said, here, here we go, how hard is it for the rich to enter the kingdom of God? In fact, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. And those who heard this said, then who in the world can be saved? And this is where we get that everyone tries to figure out a way to make it possible to get a camel. <laughs> you can get a really small camel. Like we could breed them down so they're chihuahua size. And we could make a giant needle and we could just push the little chihuahua camel uh, through the needle. Uh, you know, and, and I, I told you before that people have said, oh, there was this this needle gate and the camel, and I, I mean, it's passed around so much, people say, it's, you know, they think it's fact, but it's, it's total fabrication. Uh, <laughs> you know, and then there's all these kind of, there's these funny options that, you know, not all of you will understand because you have to understand a little Greek here, but the, the, the Greek, for, you know, or, you know, the word sometimes people are like, the camel, it sounds like, you know, the, this word for rope, and so it's saying, try to putting a rope through the eye of a needle, and, and um, there's a variation I've heard, it's, um, you know, well, they're talking about like a six inch carpet needle, and, and camel hair string was really hard to get it 
through the thing. And, um, you know, wow. you know and, and Aramaic will translate the rope of him. You know, there's all these things we can try to figure out to go, Jesus didn't really say what he said. But Jesus really said what he said. And, and everyone recognized, not like, oh, man, that must be really hard. But, but man, that's, that's impossible, Jesus. You can't get an, a, a camel through the eye of the needle. And it's, it, it's sort of like it, it's hyperbole. And, you know, Jesus said another thing he's talking about, you know, your sin. And Jesus said, you know, hey, you've got, you know, you're trying to get this speck out of your brother's eye, but you've got a plank in your own. And, and the point of that is not to figure out, okay, well, how much sin is a speck that my brother would have? And then, you know, what? how big would a plank be coming out of my eye? Can I no, it's funny because it's like you've got this little speck of dust versus a two-by-four sticking out of your head. Uh, and it's, it's hyperbole. It's kind of purposely kind of crazy. And it's like a joke. Some of you analyze jokes. You know what I mean? Like you have to go through Dimesbach to get two nickels back. And you're like, well, you'd have to go nickel. Yeah. Uh, so it was a Texas joke. Uh, but, you know, some of you kind of analyze jokes. It, it, you know, but just take it at face value. It's a funny image. But, it's, it, but Jesus uses this, this sort of crazy image to make the bigger point. Uh, you know, it, it, it's kind of like uh, when I did Strongman, I was a lot lar larger then. And we would all show up in my Honda Civic. Oh, and it was just this funny image. Oh, and it, and so, oh. <laughs> all these men <laughs> climbing sideways out of a Civic. And, <laughs> uh, it was hilarious. So it's kind of like now when I show up with deer in the back. Uh, <laughs> it's really the, the, this funny image uh, that, that sticks with you to teach you something. And, you know, in that culture, as, much, as well in our culture, a lot of people, wealth is considered the sign of blessing from God. And you've got to a lot of churches, they'll tell you, you know, that you're blessed and God's going to make you rich. And that's great. I hope God blesses you. I hope God makes you rich. And then I hope you die. But <laughs> wealth, is, wealth can be this great thing, but it can also be something that captures our heart. And we're, I think in America, I often say there's two things that I really try to teach my kids differently than our culture teaches. Number one is sexuality. Our culture has a very different view of sexuality than the Bible has. And, you know, and so I'm constantly telling them, you know, we watch TV, I'm like, not our values, not our values. Watch movies, not our values, not our values. And, you know, we, we break that down. And it's the same with money because in America, we like money. I, I, it's not bad to have money. Right. The problem is when money has you. Right. And it's easy for our, 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 our need of something and, and our, our love of something that's even good, our like of something, our strong like, to become a love of something. And, and so God gets replaced with our pursuit of money. And then it's not in God we trust, it's in money we trust. In my wealth, I trust. Um, you know, but God wants wholehearted devotion. Now, yesterday I was doing a wedding, and as I always do a wedding, I've never had this actually happen in the wedding. But I've always, you know, I, I go through the wedding vows, and they kind of know what they're getting when they get me. You're getting a Jesus-centered, gospel smackdown kind of wedding, <laughs> and I'm going to talk about Jesus. I'm going to talk about the way marriage is supposed to be. And, and as I'm going through it, you know, you get to the vows, and you know, it's there's this part. It's a little purposely vague because we don't want it to be, you know, PG-13 or plus wedding, but you know, it says, you know, forsaking all others, keeping yourself only uh, to him as long as you both shall live. Now, how many of you guys, if I said that, said that vow, you know, to your prospective wife and said, you know, forsaking all others, keeping yourself only to him so long as you both shall live, the proper response at the end is, I do. What if they were like, whoa, I want a side guy. <laughs> You'd be like, I just spent $20,000 on a party, and I'm going to punch some dude when I find out who it is. <laughs> you wouldn't be happy at all, would you? And same thing with the ladies. If he's like, hey, I want a side chick. Can we, can we work that into the bowels here? Like, we should have gone over this before. 
Like, I mean, there would be a brouhaha. You'd have his and her sides, and they would just be, like, fighting. It would be awesome. But it would be horrible. Because you want, in a marriage, what do you want? You want wholehearted devotion. You know, and, and really, that's what it is with following Jesus. Jesus wants wholehearted devotion. There's all this stuff in life that is good, but what's best is God. You know, John Calvin said the human heart is an idol-making factory. See, we can take all kinds of good things that God created, and we make them God things in our life. Money is a good thing. If you don't have any money, life is hard. <laughs> but, you know, the problem is the human heart, we get enough to, for our needs, we get enough for our wants, and then we get enough for speedboats. <laughs> and you can have a speedboat and love Jesus. And if you have a speedboat and love Jesus, I'm available this afternoon <laughs> to ride in your speedboat. <laughs> and we'll wash it and wax it and drive it and name it. <laughs> but you know, the problem is our hearts get turned to these things. And we can make all these good things that God created into God things. Now here... You know, he's talking about money. But it could also be relationships. You know, you know, Jesus, you know, we were created to be in relationships, but Jesus is first. So even in my marriage, it's easy when you're married to put your spouse first. But it's not about Denise. <laughs> it's about Jesus. It's not about Jeff. It's about Jesus. And when we put Jesus first, we have a better marriage. And, and that's, Jesus is saying, you know, hey, I have to be first. God has to be first. You know, and it says here, you know, Jesus replied after they were kind of freaked out. He says, what is impossible for people is possible with God. You know, it, it's possible because, one, God can change hearts. He forgives sins. <laughs> and, and, you know, it's, it's not that it's something impossible to happen, but it's hard. And it's, it's through faith in Christ he can make that happen. And so it's not that if you have money, you, you, you can't. But, it, you know, the gospel is good news when you recognize the bad news that we've sinned and we've messed up. We're all a little jacked up. That's like a church saying. I think that's a value, like knowing that you're jacked up. And if you don't know that you're jacked up, you really are. Right? Uh, and if you don't think you're jacked up, you're really jacked up. Because we, we sin. Now, hopefully, when you have faith in Christ, you grow in Christ. You'll sin less and less, but the truth is we're all still sinners. And what God wants, God wants our heart uh, so that ultimately we can live this different life. Um, you know, and the bottom line of the story is, you know, we can't make it to heaven if we try real hard. We can't shove a camel through the eye of the needle if it's, you know, real hard. We can't make the, you know, somehow, you know, shove a rope through a needle in some way. The point of this whole thing is that it's only through Christ, it's only through his sacrifice, it's only through that that we really have forgiveness. Um, and, and see, you know, you can make this about money, though, too, and then you're thinking you're off the hook. But it's anything that you put before God becomes this idol. Um, Peter said, we've left our homes to follow you. Jesus, uh, yes, Jesus replied. And I assure you that everyone who has given up house or wife or brothers or parents or children for the sake of the kingdom of God will be paid many times over in this life and will have eternal life in the world to come. See, unlike the rich young ruler, Peter and those with him left everything to follow Jesus. You know, and, and ultimately, the, the reward is greater than the sacrifice. You know, they didn't always have an easy life. They all, they, except for John, they, they, they're all, you know, executed their faith. John was just boiled in oil and lived, which I'm not sure which is better, being boiled in oil and living or, 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 or having been beheaded or something. Uh, you know, you know, and we'll get much back, we'll get back much more. You know, isn't a formula... Like, okay, I will give you this, God, so I get back that. Because when we start doing that, what is our real love? It's not following Christ. It's back to the money. Um, but, but ultimately, God has this eternal reward for us. Now, it's interesting. 
Now, we talk a lot about, you know, we love the Bible. That's why we teach through the Bible. That's why we actually, you know, we talk about what's in the Bible. If you look in, um, in Luke, just before this, um, Jesus tells a story. It says, one day, um, some parents brought their little children to Jesus so he could touch and bless them. But when the disciples saw this, they scolded the parents for bothering him. You know, it, you kind of picture Jesus as an important teacher, all kinds of people, and people start bringing their kids. Now, we love our kids. I mean, we like, we put them in a basket of fruit and take a picture. I never understood that, those those pictures. You know, we, you know, I mean, if you have a, if, I mean, some, I, it, it's funny because my friends who don't have kids, uh, and then they have a friend who just had a kid, and they're like, oh my gosh, they don't post anything but pictures of their kids. I'm like, don't worry, you'll understand later. And, <laughs> you know, but we love our kids in our culture, uh, but you know, they weren't as honored in, in that culture, and so the disciples are like, get your kid, little kids away from him. This is Jesus. He's got important things to do. And, and Jesus, then Jesus called the children and said, disciples, let the children come to me. Don't stop them, for the kingdom of heaven belongs to those who are like these little children. I tell you the truth, anyone who doesn't receive the kingdom of God like a child will never enter it. You know, uh, and I always think, you know, why did Jesus, kids run to Jesus? I think it was fun. You know, we had this picture of Jesus being like dour and like really sad all the time. I thought he was a fun guy. Uh, you know, it's kind of like the ice cream truck when it, you know, that, that sound goes off. You're like, who here as an adult? Here's that sound and wants to run to the ice cream truck. <laughs> and it's like, I think they take credit now because I never have any cash with me. Uh, well, I have a hundred, so if the ice cream truck comes by, we're good. Uh, but, but, you know, I mean, there's, you know, the kids are running. And that's, you know, kind of a side note. Um, I had some, there was a newer person here last week, and they're like, man, you guys have a lot of kids. You know, they were a little surprised that the church of our side had the number of, I think some weeks we have as many kids as we do adults. And they, you know, it's funny, we have the cry room and different things, but it's like, you know, they, they run around sometimes during the service, and sometimes it's funny and awkward, like, you know, dad will be playing guitar and they run up to him, and we just laugh, because I love being in a church with lots of kids, because, you know, I would hate to be in a church without kids, we love kids, so uh, this is like, you know, Jesus stuff, because Jesus like kids. And, you know, uh, we don't want them to go nuts, but we just laugh when they run around. Uh, but here, it's like Jesus then, you know, he's like hey, saying, hey, this childlike faith is what we want. But then right after that, you see the rich young ruler, the guy with power, position, and wealth, who probably looked good at church. <laughs> it's, it's this juxtaposition of two very starkly different things to make a point. You know, we tend to think it's about us and it's about positions, what we do, but Jesus is looking for this childlike faith and devotion. Kids, man, like when they do something, they are all in it, right? <laughs> I mean, if they get an ice cream, they're getting ice cream. <laughs> and that's really what the gospel's about. It's, it's being all in on this thing with this, this childlike faith. You know, Jesus was asked, again, he was asked the same question, and he gives different answers. Like with the Good Samaritan, you know, he, he says, you know, hey, lo love God, love, love your neighbor, you know, well, what, who's my neighbor? And he kind of goes into that because he's going, hey, there's this thing that you, that you got that, that you need to work on. Um, you know, and see, this story really isn't even about money. It's about the things that have our hearts and the things that keep us from trusting and following him. You know, it's hard because we tend to trust our abilities, our finances, our talents, our skills. And, and honestly, sometimes it's, it's harder to trust Jesus than ourselves. We, we naturally rely on those things, but, but God wants us to trust him and him alone. And, and there's this danger in America because we're religious, we're moral, we're wealthy, we're upright, we go to church on Sundays, that we think that we're somehow right with God. But, but we're right with God by our faith. Uh, you know, it, it, it's only by faith. Um, you know, and we tend to take the good things and make God things out of them, but God wants to deal with our heart. Uh, now, here's the thing. You know, how do you recognize idols in your life? Um, number one, rec we recognize our idolatry when someone tries to take it away. Golem. 
<laughs> it's easy to go, man, what just got all on the idol? Like the, the, the ring, right? Some of you don't know what I'm talking about. You should watch a movie. It's good. Um, it, and it's long, though, so it's going to be the rest of your afternoon. Um, we'll get the projector working this time, and then we'll do the entire trilogy. Uh, until two o'clock in the morning, uh, but you know, Gollum, you, you know, he's going after the ring because it's my precious. You know, what's the thing if someone took from you, you'd be like, my precious. <laughs> uh, re we recognize our idolatry when we follow the money. Uh, it was funny. I was, we were driving back from. Uh, we feed at Interfaith during the week and things, and we're driving back. We're talking about something. I was like, we're talking about a particular thing. I'm like, yeah, I just found the money for that, and I'm like. Well, I probably do. It's just I spend my money on different things. <laughs> because really, what we spend our money on is what we... Assuming you have a general income that covers your basic expenses, then what's really important to us comes out in how we spend it. Yeah, I can't make my mortgage payment. That's because it's $5,000 a month. Why <laughs> not? <laughs> you know, because oh, I had to have the pool. And, you know, oh, it's so hard to make my car payment because it's a thousand dollars a month. <laughs> uh, and a friend who I think his entire salary went to his car payment. Uh, it's a really nice car. <laughs> but you know, what what we value, we'll spend our money on. You know, if, if it's our entertainment, if it's you know, if it, you know. And then we, it's like we ask God for more money. We baptize our greed and say, I'll give more. <laughs> um, and the, the thing is, like, you can be, you can be, you can have money and be, and be righteous. You know, but, because there's good ways to make money. There, there's, there's good financial ways. There's good godly principles in the Bible about how to make money. But you can, uh, but you, but you can also love money. And it's the same. You can be righteous and poor, or you could just be greedy and not have the money because you spent it and poor. And, and so there, there's good ways and bad ways to do that. But only, you know, what's what's my motivation with my money? Is, is it to provide for family? You know, or is it personal pride, power, self-worth? Well, I'm going to carry my golf clubs. Um, you know, <laughs> I, I think another question asked is, what is the one thing that would bring you ultimate happiness if you had it? Think about it. There's something everybody wants. You think, man, that one thing, and then I'll be happy, God. Will you? Because we'll just want something else. I can't tell you how many things I thought I had to have this, and then it's like in the yard sale pile, and you're like, yep, yeah, had to have that. I had to have that exercise machine late at night. Bando flex. Why that give me the abs? Why just wrapped in bubble wrap? <laughs> um, you know, it's like it's like relationships. We, you know, relationships are good. It's but they become God in our lives. It, it's good to find a good godly spouse. Makes life a lot easier. I'll tell you. Love my spouse. She has a skill set I don't have. You know, it really helps us in life. But you know, she can't become God in my life. She's just got to say something good. Right. Um, and ultimately, you know, those things can't satisfy. The only thing that's really going to give you peace in your life is this relationship with God. So here, if Jesus were here today, what would he ask you to give up to follow him? You know, and I think we have to ask God, you know, what's in my life that keeps me from fully trusting you? Is it relationships? My plans? My status? Education, friends, you know, and, and if you're not if you're not following, you just have to ask, you know, what's holding you back? John ten ten, Jesus said, "I've come. The thief comes to steal and kill and destroy. I've come to live my life and have it to the full. The, 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 the fullest life you're ever going to have is following Jesus. It, it's simple as you know, ABC. You know, we admit and we accept that you know, <coughs> you know we're a sinner. We accept Jesus into our life, and we, we believe we become children of." of God and then we confess that Jesus is Lord we're, we're made right with him and, and sometimes as believers you know I, I think we need to be reminded that it's not about these things it's not about wealth it, it's not about security it's not about status it's not about identity and we have to be careful that these things 
don't become a barrier to serving Christ. You know, and I was thinking about, you know, how do you really learn to trust daily? Um, I was thinking, it's a lot, I think part of it's just a leap. Faith is a leap. I remember one time I was canoeing up in Canada, um, and we canoed to this one area, and we, we drove up, we rode up to this cliff, because we had to take our, wherever we camped, we went across this cliff, we tied up our canoes, and we climbed up this mountain, and we looked down, and the guy checked it first, and it was safe, but it didn't look that tall when we got up there, I mean, when we were down below in the canoes, but we got up there, we're standing on a cliff, and he's like, dive off, and I'm like, <laughs> You've got to be kidding me. <laughs> and if you've hiked with me, you know I'm slightly afraid of heights, especially as I age. And so I'm standing on there, and I was one of the, the older kids, so all the younger kids are kind of waiting for me to jump off. And I am, like, terrified. I'm like, I am probably going to die. But at least people will think much of me as I go. And so I finally got the courage because I'm playing cool, and I jumped off the cliff. Now, it was a risk. It was scary, but it was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> and then I jumped off like 50 more times. <laughs> and that's really what faith is. It's scary. It's a risk. But at some point, you got to commit and jump. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible. It's life-changing. And, you know, I, I think after you start that, that cliff dive for Jesus, then it's about... Spending time in prayer and reading the Bible is one of the ways that will help you keep those things out of your life that keep you, um, that become idols in your life. You know, and ultimately ask God to reveal through the Holy Spirit, you know, what are these things that keep me from following you? What do I need to eliminate? What do I need to put in the right place? Um, what do I need to let go so I can take that step and tie off that cliff? Um, as the band comes back to play, um, Curtis, we would love to pray for you this week. We have the, the cards. You can um, you can fill these out. Um, uh, we'd love to pray for you during the week, and we'd love to. Uh, so feel free, fill one out. You can put it on the.